We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so our first presenter is Michael Baldwin. Um, Michael is currently a PhD candidate at, of mechanical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. His research areas include cryogenic heat transfer, boiling, and condensation, and multi-phase flows. His undergraduate degree, also at Georgia Tech, was in nuclear and radiolo radiological engineering. He spent the last three summers working in the thermal analysis branch at Marshall Space Flight Center for both NASA and Jacobs Engineering Exploration Group. He also enjoys teaching engineering classes and has been the recipient of the campus-wide teaching award as an instructor at Georgia Tech. So with that, we're going to have Michael start presenting and uh, you can go ahead. All right, thank you, Ryan. Let me share my slides here. I have trouble saying radiological too, so don't worry. Okay. Okay. okay, so yes, Ryan, thank you again for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to present to you today the ongoing work I'm doing uh, with NASA um, involving boiling channel modeling and its implementation into a NASA program, GFSSP. There we go. Okay, so the objective of my, my work is to develop a boiling model and implement it into this program, GFSSP, with specific emphasis on the cryogenic fluids, hydrogen, methane, and oxygen. Uh, these three fluids can be used as rocket fuel, and that's why they are of particular interest to NASA, and I've uh, focused my work around these three. I have uh, broken the presentation into two parts. So the first part, we're going to talk about the current state of cryogenic flow boiling. I'm going to briefly go over the different flow regimes that we usually encounter when we deal with flow boiling. And then I'm going to show the uh, available test data and the available correlations that have been developed specifically for cryogenic fluids. In the second half, I will talk about how we are trying to implement this model into GFSSP. I'll talk a little bit about GFSSP and then I'll show some example test cases where we've compared test data to uh, GFSSP predictions and we'll see how good they compare. So for part one, we'll talk about the, the current state of cryogenic flow boiling. So on this image here on the right, there are two pipes. And the easiest way for me to begin re uh, reviewing the different flow boiling regimes is to divide it into two cases. So there's a low heat flux case and a high heat flux case. And I'm going to talk about both of them individually. So let's start with the low heat flux case. So on the left there, there is a, a temperature profile sketch of the, of the wall. This is to help you as we talk about the different flow regimes, kind of get an idea of how the, the different flow regimes affect the heat transfer. And that's kind of one of the main points I'm trying to make this presentation is that it's important that we know which flow regime we're in because the heat transfer is drastically impacted. And so it's, it's important to know where we are and when we transition. Um, let me see if I can do yes. All right, so let's start at the bottom of the pipe. So it's a... Um, Flow is going from bottom to top, so in a, and this is again the low heat flux case. So we're going to start with single phase flow, and the fluid is going to be continuously heated until bubbles start to form on the wall. This is a point called the onset of nucleate boiling, and this is where boiling initially happens. So as from this point on, all the way up to this dry out point, I have where. Uh, this is going to be called the nuclear boiling regime. Now, it could be a subcooled nuclear boiling regime or saturated. That just depends on the bulk fluid temperature. But as far as the correlations and the modeling is concerned, it's just a nuclear boiling regime. Now, up here where dry out is, you can see that toward the end, there is a liquid film that is slowly evaporating, and then right here, it vanishes completely. So this is what is known as dry out, when the liquid is no longer touching the edge of the wall. And this is the start of a heat transfer regime known as dispersed flow boiling. 
Um, so now that there's no liquid touching the wall, in fact, the heat transfer plummets, and that is shown here by the sudden jump in the wall temperature. Um, in fact, the difference in heat transfer effectiveness is about one to two orders of magnitude different. So um, this is all for the low heat flux case. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, the heat transfer in the nuclear boiling regime versus the dispersed flow boiling regime are drastically different. And so it's important to know that these are the two regimes that we can expect to see. So next is the high heat flux case. So starting again from the bottom, we have single phase flow until the bubbles first start to form. This is the onset of nuclear boiling again, just like in the last case. Then we again, we have the nuclear boiling until the fluid leaves the wall. Now in this case, the fluid leaves the wall in a, in a different way. So right here, you can kind of see that the fluid sort of just departs from the wall and there's a, a thin vapor film that separates the core of the channel from the wall. This is called departure from nucleate boiling. And again, this is an area where the heat transfer plummets and the wall temperature shoots up. And we now enter the regime known as film boiling, which some of you are I'm sure are familiar with. Uh, up here, there is a model to determine whether where we transition from film boiling to dispersed flow boiling, but um, that happens somewhere in the channel. So anyway, that's really all I wanted to say about the heat, the uh, different heat transfer regimes for um, the flow boiling. Just keep in mind as I continue that there's three separate zones or regimes that we need to account for in order to appropriately model boiling. Okay. So here are currently some test experiments that have been done with these three cryogenic fluids that are available. Now, these are not the experiments that I have chosen to use for my research. These are all of the experiments that I could find that exist, period, for these fluids uh, as it pertains to flow boiling. So for hydrogen, there were seven, methane five, and literally zero for oxygen. I have one there because I did find a critical heat flux experiment, but as far as heat transfer in the nuclear boiling regime or the film boiling regime, I could not find anything. Uh, so this is just uh, the, the test data that we have to work with. There's not many. As far as correlations go to model the heat transfer coefficient for cryogens, uh, again, I can only find two. So there is Klominko and Steiner and Tabarek. These are both nucleate boiling correlations. Uh, Klominko had about 300 data points, most of them nitrogen. And Steiner and Tabarek had over 13,000 data points. Now for Steiner correlation, uh, there was a mix of fluids, a wide range. There's water, refrigerants, hydrocarbons, and cryogens. But the nice thing about this correlation is depending on which fluid you are analyzing, the authors suggest specific coefficients. So uh, later I'll talk about a methane test case and he has specific values for methane um, to use in his correlation. So that is why I included his correlation here because in a sense it is specific to cryogenic fluids. Many of the experiments that I've looked at, of course, they fit their own data, and there's a they present a, an equation that models their data well, but I did not include those here because those aren't, in my opinion, you know, studies that went to develop an actual cryogenic correlation. It just happens to be a, um, you know, a good a good fit for their data. So that's the end of uh, part one. So just a summary slide here. To appropriately model boiling, we need to consider the nucleate boiling regime, the film boiling regime, and the dispersed flow boiling regime, all of which have heat transfer coefficients that vary uh, drastically between one another. Um, also, the transitions between these regimes, namely the onset of nucleate boiling, the departure from nucleate bo boiling, and dry out, also need to be modeled appropriately so we know when we're transitioning uh, from regime to regime. 
And finally, uh, flow boiling data and heat transfer correlations specific to cryogenic fluids are severely lacking in the literature. All right. So for the second part, let's talk about how we are trying to implement these ideas into this NASA program, GFSSP. The GFSSP is an acronym for Generalized Fluid System Simulation Program. It is a system level CFD code developed at NASA in the early 90s. It has since been proven to accurately model several uh, hydrodynamic test cases. So I'm now just going to talk about the basic functions of GFSSP. So if we just look at this top row only for now, well, this is what we need to solve any kind of hydrodynamic problem. So there are fluid boundary nodes here, number one and number six. So this is where you can input your fluid temperature, your fluid pressure, and your quality at the inlet and the outlet of your system. Between the boundary nodes, you have fluid nodes which are places where the mass and energy equations are solved and the pressures and enthalpies at these positions are determined. In between the fluid nodes, you have fluid branches where the momentum equation is solved for flow rates. So with these three elements alone, we can solve everything we need uh, for the hydrodynamic solution. Now, GS GFSSP also can do heat transfer capabilities, and that is what the rest of the model here is going to highlight, the heat transfer. So if you're interested in heat transfer, you can add solid nodes, which are here, the bolded boxes, where you can supply a heat source or a heat flux. We have solid-to-solid -solid conductors, which model the conduction of heat within the solid. And then you have fluid to solid conductors, which model the conjugate heat transfer. And this is where I am spending most of my time. So GFSSP is a Fortran based code. So if, if you're trying to model a system that is not in the program currently, you have to write your own user subroutine in Fortran. And that is what I'm trying to do is to write the boiling code into these conjugate heat transfer elements and the goal of course is for the code to be able to predict which heat transfer code uh, I'm sorry which boiling regime we are in select the appropriate heat transfer correlation and uh, GFSSP will then use that information to predict the wall temperatures and the fluid temperatures here is the boiling model that I have currently I'm working on and I propose to go into GFSSP. Uh, I don't want to go through the entire flow chart, but I just want to highlight a couple things. So here are our transition points. This is the onset of nucleate boiling. Here is our transition point, the departure from nucleate boiling. And then here is the dry out condition. So those were the three transition points that we talked about earlier. And also just notice all in all of these boxes are the various flow regimes that we could encounter that we talked about at the beginning. So there's nucleate boiling, you can see on the left there. There's the film boiling and the dispersed flow film boiling. And then there's the saturated nucleate boiling. And there are different ways to get to the different regimes. But um, uh, the point is that all of the regimes are here. And I wanted to compare this to the next slide, which is the current model for, um, or the current way that GFSSP treats two-phase um, boiling. That is right here. So currently what GFSSP does is if there is any quality at all, so if, if it's a liquid, it just does single phase liquid. If it's a vapor, it does single phase vapor. If there's any quality at all, doesn't matter what regime you're in, it simply uh, uses this one equation, this one uh, correlation of Mirapolsky to model the boiling process. So Mirapolsky is a post-critical heat flux a film or dispersed flow film boiling regime, and it was originally developed using water. So it doesn't matter what fluid we're dealing with or what regime we're dealing with, GFSSP currently just has one equation to model all of it. 
and I apologize for this uh, break in the equation. I thought I fixed that. So I'm trying to implement this, and GFSSP currently has this. So uh, here, before I show some of the example test cases that I've done, here are the three equations that I will be using uh, in the graphs. Uh, the, uh, the top two here, Chin and Steiner, are nuclear boiling correlations. Now, in my work at Georgia Tech, I'm currently investigating 16 different correlations. But these two so far, and again, this work is ongoing, so I haven't uh, analyzed all of the test cases and I haven't used all of the correlations yet. But of the ones that I've tested, these two have shown to be very good. And so I've included them here. And at the bottom, there is a uh, Groneveld, which is a dispersed flow boiling regime, which I've also tested, or it also shows good agreement. So I have two test cases. The first one is the test data of Wang et al. And this is a nucleate boiling methane test case. So here is the test section starting here in this entire pipe, but only certain portions of the pipe are heated, shown here. So what I, what I decided to model was just one heated uh, element of the pipe here. So here is my inlet and here is my outlet. And at the bottom there is my GFSSP model. And uh, for reference, the, the model only took about five minutes to create, and it takes less than a second to run. And here are some of the results. So I have four plots here. All of them are very similar, so I'll spend the most time on this one and kind of brush through the next one. So this plot shows heat transfer uh, coefficient versus quality. The, here is the test data. These two are the nucleate boiling correlations I showed on the previous slide. You can see that they agree with each other pretty well, and they underpredict the test data by about 24%. And as far as heat transfer goes, this is still pretty good. And then, of course, down at the bottom, we have Mirapolsky. And again, the Mirapolsky correlation is the the current correlation that GFSSP uses. And the reason that it's so poor here is because the Mirapolsky correlation, again, is a film boiling correlation. And this is a nucleate boiling test case. So this is why the heat transfer is under predicted by several orders of magnitude. All right, so here is another plot. This is the heat transfer versus the heat flux. And again, you can see that the nuclear boiling correlations agree fairly well with each other. They predict the data within 17%. Then there's Mirapolsky at the bottom. Here is heat transfer coefficient versus mass flux. Same story here, predicts the data within 25%. And finally, here's the heat transfer coefficient versus pressure. And they predict the heat transfer to within about 26%. Okay. And the final one is going to be a liquid hydrogen film boiling test case. So this is the test data of Hendrix. And here is the heated test section here. And here's the inlet of my model, and there's the outlet. And here are, I only have one graph for this one. The X's there are the test data. The blue circles are the correlation that I've, I have implemented for this regime, the Groneveld correlation. And then there is the current correlation, the GFS, excuse me, the GFSSP uses uh, Mirapolsky. Um, so Mirapolsky and the Groneveld do much better here in comparison. And again, that is because now we are in a film boiling correlation. So, uh, sorry, a film boiling regime. So, Mirapolsky appropriately does model uh, the result on the correct order of magnitude. But uh, the Groneveld correlation in this particular case uh, appears to do better. So, that pretty much wraps up my uh, presentation. Uh, some conclusions are that. 
Currently, the Steiner and the Chin correlations, which are nuclear boiling correlations, agree with each other very well. And they do predict the, uh, this particular methane test data uh, within about 25%. The Mirapolsky correlation is not a bad correlation for film boiling of hydrogen, but it fails to model nuclear boiling data appropriately. And again, it's under predicts by about two orders of magnitude. So what, the, what we still have to do is to determine the best correlations for each regime for each fluid. So my, my ultimate goal is to not only have a correlation selected for each regime, but also have uh, a correlation selected for each regime for each fluid. It's very possible that certain regimes work well for hydrogen, but not for methane, for example. So I'm also investigating which correlations do better for each fluid. Um, the nuclear boiling and the film boiling uh, model has been implemented in GFSSP, but the model itself is still incomplete, so I still need to finish it and try to find test cases that have multiple regimes within the same test case to see if GFSSP can handle the change in uh, heat transfer coefficient. Uh, if possible, I can analyze the, core, uh, the data that I've accumulated and develop a correlation, if that's even possible. And then finally, um, suggest experiments that can be done to fill these gaps, because again, there's a lack of data available for these cryogenic fluids. Uh, so there's much to be done, and uh, I hope to suggest experiments that'll help us model these cryogens better. Uh, so that is all. Thank you very much for your attention. I will now take uh, any questions. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll see if uh, any questions come in. We do have one. Uh, it did seem like earlier some people were having audio issues, but refreshing the page on the stream helped out a lot. Um, so that's that's good. I think that was that was just briefly. So hopefully people weren't having too many issues. Um, we do have one question right now from John. Do models account for the orientation of flow with respect to the gravity vector? Yes. Um, so the first, I'll answer that in two ways. So first is the GFSSP program itself. So within the pipe, you can select gravity. So GFSSP accounts for gravity if you give it that option. As far as the correlations, um, most of them also do account. For, they do not, well, let me see. For nuclear boiling, gravity isn't necessarily, well, it is. Gravity is always accounted for. The orientation of the, the pipe, vertical or horizontal, there, as far as film boiling, for nuclear boiling, it's not important, but the correlations account for all orientations. But for film boiling, there are specific correlations which are designed for specific orientations. And when I do test the film boiling correlations, I specifically, I only include the test data that's relevant to that correlation. So, yeah, that's my answer to that. All right, uh, all right. Uh, so we have another question from Dan. Uh, do you plan to make the correlations available to the larger GFSSP community? <laughs> well, uh, that <laughs> is probably not my call. Uh, yeah. Um, but because GFSSP, again, is a NASA owned program. But I mean, if the modeling is successful and we can show that GFSSP can accurately produce good results as, when compared to different test data, then yeah, I believe that the authors, which I, I've worked with both of the gentlemen who created this code, and they continue to update it on a, you know, they, they, this is what they do. They continue to update the code as part of their job. And yeah, I think they are going to implement the correlations into GFSSP and then they will be available for all users. Yes. That is my guess. All right. That sounds good. Uh, let's see. We have another question from FSU. Have you ever considered the Shragi model for vaporization? Hmm. I have not. I'm going to write that down, though, and look into it. Shragi, can you spell that for me? S-C-H-R-A-G-E. I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but <laughs> what it sounds like. Okay. No, I have not considered that. Okay. 
Uh, another question from Hamed. Could GFSSP consider condensation studies as well? So it's good, good question. So I've done a little bit of condensation work with GFSSP in previous summers. Currently, no. So the way it handles condensation now is this. Um, it just uses Mirapolsky still because if 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 you're condensing and for whatever reason GFSSP recognizes that your quality is less than one, it's going to treat it as a two phase system and just use Mirapolsky. It does not have any condensation capabilities built in just yet. But again, I have I have that's another project, a side project I have been working on to try to do a condensation model similar to this project and implement it. Um, but yeah, currently it does not have it, and hopefully it will um, one day because it's one of the projects that we're working on. All right, sounds good. All right, so we have just got another question from Joseph. When you discretize the pipe, do you have to manually or automatically switch between correlations in the different sections? Um, let's see, you can, so yeah, for each pipe, you can select which correlation you want it to use, or you can select, um, user subroutine. And that, and that's what I do. So I have them all as user subroutine because I just assume that it's going to be two phase. And if it's not, then I have in my subroutine, I just I implement the single phase correlations as well. So I don't you can select certain branches to do certain correlations if you'd like, or you can just write your own code to and then it will automatically go to your code in every branch and do whatever you want it to do. And that's what I do. And sometimes it ends up being a single phase heat transfer correlation I use, and sometimes it recognizes that it's in two phase and it uses the appropriate correlation. But the answer to your question is you do not have to, but you can if you desire to do that. All right. Let's see. We got two other questions, both related to each other um, and just GFSSP in general. Um, so GFSSP is the question is, is it CFD based or just nodal? Nodal base. I think it's just nodal, but um, right. and then additionally, is it capable of two D, three D modeling? And you, you can go ahead and talk right. to that. So it is technically a CFD code, but it is nodal based. So it still solves the the Navier-Stokes equation, the momentum equation. It's just it doesn't it doesn't. There's no meshing involved. You don't mesh your system in very fine, and you don't have to solve the equations at every element like you do in, for for example, ANSYS fluid. But it still does solve the same equations. So, um, but it is just nodal based. It cannot do two uh, two D or three D flow. It's more of a system level code that just solves for temperatures, pressures, qualities. Um, enthalpies at different positions in your system. Uh, so it's more interested in those properties or, uh, or wall temperatures, of course, as well. Um, so, but yeah, it, it only does um, 1D flow. Okay. All right. That's what I, that's what I thought as well. Um, so right now there's no more other questions, but they do keep on coming up, but we are at just, there's like two minutes left. Um, but just for everyone on the stream and 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 here, uh, our next presenter also dropped out. Right, at, so it, we're not going to have another presentation and for another half an hour. Um, so we'll have another break here. Um, if more questions show up here soon, we can ask those. But it's also we're we're hitting our limit here. Um, so uh, I don't know. Does any anyone else have any questions? Uh, it's the last chance. <laughs> And, and Ryan, while you're while we're waiting for those last ones to come in, I would like to add that um, there is a GFSSP uh, vendor session this afternoon. You check your agendas um, at two thirty Central Time. So if you are interested, um, we we do have another session coming up today. Yeah, that would probably be good. A lot of these questions you can go over there and see see how it works and. Um, 
ask some more. Uh, I might interject there. If you, I think uh, the person running that is Andre Leclerc, and he is one of the two gentlemen I referred to who continuously write the source code and update this program on a daily basis. So if you do have questions about it, he will is an expert and definitely knows how to the inner workings of this program. All right, it looks like he's in the chat as well. So uh, <laughs> he's oh, well, answering questions right. there. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think that's 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 been half an hour there. So we'll uh, good job, uh, great great presentation, and uh, 